Life Master Brian Wall here, talking from Denver, Colorado, in the home of Chris Peterson and Robert Ramirez. Today I want to talk about situations where your minor pieces, your bishops and knights, acquire enormous power. And I didn't have the faith of my pieces, and I missed four chances where I could have made them super pieces. And I compare it to blowfish, pufferfish, animal, when it gets scared, it inhales air or water and makes itself look much bigger than it is trying to scare away enemies. So here's some situations where the bishop and knight are much stronger than normal and you have to be aware of these and uh, and realize that they can happen and maybe you won't miss the, all the chances like I did. And we're going to look at four times when I missed the power of my own pieces. My opponent is Robert Ramirez. He won eight tournaments in the last 12 months in Colorado. He's a good candidate for our next chess master. I think the last two were Tyler Hughes and Josh Bloomer. Just to give you a little uh, background on me this year, I've won six tournaments in a row, gone up 70 straight points with just a repertoire of A6 as black, which I've been playing for 40 years, and the Tromp for white. Trompowski. This line looks a little crazy. Why would black agree to give me the center in exchange for a, a weak rook pawn? The secret is he has the two bishops and my dark squared bishop is gone so he's going to attack all my dark squares. And that's his compensation. That's why grandmasters have been playing this line for decades for black. So, in this position, Robert played that. Uh, the next week, Dean Brown played uh, this move. And the correct answer is this. And you're stopping the bishop and queen from coming out here. They're going to move my knights out. And then later, I'll play e3. And the idea is that um, I played this right away, and then I had to guard my pawn with my king. So if you play queen d2 first, you avoid that. I don't know what I'm doing in this opening. I just play things, and I learn as I go. So Robert uh, played a different approach. He attacked my b2 pawn. And now if he takes it, he has to move his king. And humans hate that. So he blocked my queen. Now I thought for half an hour. I have a lot of good moves. Rook b1 is a good move. But um, I just refused to guard my b pawn. And Robert refused to take it. So the game went like this. Now... Um, this black pawn here is blocking Robert's queen and bishop. So I bypass it. Robert's in the background. You can hear him rumbling around like a strawberry raccoon. And the natural thing is not to take this. Again, Robert has a chance to take the b pawn. This is correct from a computer point of view, but it looks very uncomfortable from a human point of view. So Robert played the more natural... 95, now he's lost. For example, one line would be here. And horrible things were happening to Robert's king. So he was forced to move his king on the check. Now it's he tries to chase away my bishop, but no more horrible things happen. This is where I missed the killer knight move. This is an opportunity for my knight to become um, infinitely powerful. I'm threatening checkmate in one. I'm threatening the queen, and the queen cannot guard the rook. And so he's going to lose his king and queen soon. 
there's no way out of the mate. Just for completeness, I'll show you what actually did happen in the game. The move I was planning was this. Now I missed another win with this. I didn't go into this line because any way I take the rook doesn't win. That's Robert getting his first drink of water in the morning. But there is a win with this. The idea is to pin the bishop against the rook. Now the bishop can't take back and so it's game over. And I played a completely different line from all this. I'll show you what happened really quick. Alright, so that's what actually happened in the game and I won. But I asked myself, why did I miss that d6 move? And then I thought about other times that I missed killer moves like that, including one the very week before. The Denver Chess Club meets at 2400 South Ash. Chris Peterson has a website if you want to know more. And the week before I played Robert Ramirez, Chris is looking at me. I think I'm supposed to say that the website is denverchessclub.com. Uh, the week before I played Ramirez, I played Hartsuck, who has an even score with me. He loves Sherlock Holmes. He loves end games. He plays aggressive openings. He's a pretty tough player for me. So this year I've been playing a6, and I won five tournaments in a row. And we just expose into the O'Kelly variation. Let me flip this. So you can feel my power. And in this position, if the knight retreats, say to f3 or b3, he's slightly better, but he advanced too far. Now, taken with the queen is a big mistake, because he can support his knight next with a pawn or a bishop, and he's doing fine. Now here I saw the right move, and even I even saw the right idea, but I didn't play it. If I attack the knight this way, then if he plays f3 to try and lock up the white squares, I might have that square available. But I went the wrong direction. And now if he played like e3, followed by bishop d3 and castles, uh, he would be fine, and I might even offer a draw soon since we were one point ahead of everyone else and we could lock in first place money. But uh, he had spent half an hour on this move. Let's go back a little bit. I forgot to mention this. On this sacrifice, which is completely unsound, but he wanted to look at it. And he doesn't have much for his piece here. So he spent half an hour on that. And so then when we got to this position, he just instantly played that move, which loses time. Um, should have played f3. Now he gets into more trouble. Now here I have great move, this is a great move, uh, this is a great move, this is a great move, I think this is best. So I have a lot of good moves, but I thought why should my rook have to watch that a pawn? So I move this rook, and now he's doing okay if he plays this, and here he's threatening a perpetual, and then punishing my rook move. So he would actually be kind of okay on that move. I'd be a little bit better. But he's still trying to rush. So he played there. Now he's getting killed. Uh, that's actually best. That's how bad his position is. Best, best, best. Now this is where, again, I 
miss a chance to make a minor piece sing. The minor piece can reach a high note. The minor piece can blow up like a blowfish. The minor piece can get enormous power, however you want to put it. I didn't realize how strong this was if I had played um, here. And the knight does everything. It guards the S6 pawn against a perpetual check. It guards E3 against stopping me from queening. And so if you, this makes a random move, now he can't even take my queen because he'll be back rank mated. So in other words, I could have made that knight a monster knight, but I failed again. All right, our next two examples will be positions where the bishops acquire infinite power. And this is one of the five tournaments in a row I won with A6. This was at Zach Beckedahl's house in Fort Collins. It was an expert master tournament. And I think I have three wins and three draws with Eric Monte. And I had played a similar opening with Jackson Chan, who's only 13 year old expert. And Eric was kind of talking how he could have beat me in that position, so we quickly repeated it. And the English grandmasters, Basman and Miles, used to play a6, eight. They would play it with b5 and c5. And I played a different way. I've been playing it this way for decades. And when uh, Jackson Chen got the opportunity, this is not the exact position, but when he had the opportunity to recapture on d5, he immediately took with the e pawn. But Eric Montany takes with the c pawn. And we sort of transpose into a system uh, David Vigorito, I am David Vigorito, taught me 20 years ago. He calls it Laufer g5, with his, which is German for bishop g5. It's the same as with a bishop on g5. So I've been playing this for 25 years. But it's also one of Eric's favorite systems, so I'm in the position of playing against my own opening. So I have sort of a decent type Benoni position. And now um, Eric shocked me because I thought I was trapping his bishop, but then I realized that he'll just get it back with this. So, I mean, I thought I was trapping his knight on g3. So, I changed gears, and we just swapped a bunch of stuff. Now, this is the funny part. In order to make room for his knight on f1, he moves his rook and ends up trapping his other knight, because now th the queen knight has nowhere to go. So, Eric doesn't give up. He tries to create some complications and he succeeds. He can't really take my knight because I'll take his rook and back rank meet him. So he counterattacks and I make the quick decision which is to give up a rook and a knight. And I have two pieces for a rook plus that e pawn is a monster so he's losing. If he takes my rook I'll just mate him on the back rank again. Like that. So he kept fighting. And now this is the opportunity again where the, my bishop acquires infinite power, but I missed it. I only had a couple of minutes, but I swear I'd already seen this and I forgot it. And I just created queens here and won the ending. But I could have done this. Now my e2 pawn cuts off all his major pieces and his king is defenseless against my queen and bishop. And it'll be mate shortly, something like this. So 
So that's my third chance where I could have made a hero out of a minor piece. And All right, the Eric Montigny game was played in February 14th, Valentine's Day of 2012. And my last example of failing to appreciate my minor pieces, in this case, both my bishops, was played in the North American Open at the end of May 2010, which I won, in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Used to take road trips there with Kurt Carlson, Steve Dykstra, James Hamlin, etc. John Watson. And the opening requires a little explanation. Um, first of all, back in 92, I lived with uh, three chess masters, officially Joel Johnson, who was a senior champion of America, and Jack Young, who's an opening expert. He creates funny openings, he plays moves that look ridiculous, and then he plays the rest of the game like a grandmaster, so the guy feels real goofy, like, I know something wrong happened, but I lost. And I write my own chess group, Brian Wall Chess, at yahoogroups.com. And I have, I don't know, 12,000 emails I've written all over the world to hundreds of people. And I also write to unorthodox, unorthodox chess openings at yahoogroups.com. And I post a lot of my crazy ideas, most of which I got from Jack Young. And there's one guy there that, I don't know, I rubbed in the wrong way, and he just likes to say, oh, everything Brian does is poppycock, it's all on sound, it's all nonsense. Well, they're all joke openings, so the joke's on you. And his name is Earl, and he's from New Zealand, and he has zero sense of humor. So rather than fight the guy head on, I decided I would create an opening in his honor, and I call it the Toxic Badger. And first I invented an opening in Josh Bloom's basement in 2004 that goes like this. And I have a video on this too. And this is the Full Metal Jacket. And there's a YouTube video if you Google Full Metal Jacket Chess. So the opening I named after Earl, since he kept badgering me, um, was this. And the idea is that F7 is like a little badger den, and that my knight might even hide in my little badger den. Then I kept playing blitz games with it, hundred thousands of them. And I decided to go an extra mile, and then I invented a plan like this, and I call it the Exxon Valdez. The idea is that my white squares are toxically weak, and the opening obviously looks like garbage. And the black pawn structure is sort of like a super tanker that goes aground. So I call this the Exxon Valdez, and that wasn't crazy enough. Then I extended that to something even more toxic and ridiculous. And I call this the BP oil spill. In other words, a complete disaster. And that is the opening of this game. So I knew a Chuck Johnson in college, and he said the funniest comment about a tournament I've ever heard. He said that the tournament was great if you were a deaf polar bear. In other words, the room was freezing and noisy. And that Chuck Johnson actually Googled that comment and joined my Yahoo group a couple of years ago. And this Chuck Johnson is, um, I don't know, he's like a 20-year-old Oklahoma player with a 1900 rating. Probably expert by now. So this is the young Chuck Johnson, the new Chuck Johnson in Oklahoma, May 2010, Stillwater, Oklahoma. And I'm black. Let me flip it. And this is all to get to a shining example of not appreciating your bishops. And when I have the pawn structure uh, with h5 and g5, and all my light squares are ridiculous, obviously any computer or grandmaster would smash me into ribbons here. But um, it's to honor Earl from unorthodoxchessopenings.com. It's an offshoot of the Toxic Badger and an offshoot of the Exxon Valdez openings, which I invented. So we 
rock on. And now, soon we're going to get to a critical idea. Now, this idea, I first saw it in a Petrosian game in the King's Indian. And it's a famous game. Me and Vigorito used to laugh about it quite a bit. Because what Petrosian did is he locked up one side of the board, put his king there, and then opened up the other side. And the comment, I think it was by Gollumbeck, was that Petrosian looked bored the whole game. Like, this game was strategically decided. Why are you even bothering to play any moves? So this is the Petrosian plan. Now the king side is locked up. Chuck has no pawn breaks there. So I'll put my king on the king side and open up the queen side and go for mate on the other side. So here we go. King on the safe side. Now shifting all the pieces to the queen side. And also like Petrosian, I give up the exchange. The exchange doesn't mean much when you're as strong as Petrosian. Here I make a cool move to free the bishop. Now this is where I did not appreciate my bishop. This is kind of sad. I don't think I had much time left, but the thing is you've got to believe in the power of your minor pieces and let them flourish. So what I could have done is this. Check. Check to free this square for my queen. Check. Now if he goes this way, it's mate. And the same thing with the other rook. Now the funny thing is, one move later I could have done it with the other bishop. And I'll show you that line. Okay, so I put the second best move here. And now I could have played, I played queen before I lost all my advantage. That's the move I played and lost all my advantage. But what I could have played is this. And now my queen and the other bishop started making that. And I won't go into all the variations, but my bishop could have combined with my queen in two different ways, and I failed. So hopefully this will give you um, an idea. Maybe look for these ideas in your own games where a minor piece suddenly becomes immensely powerful. Thank you, Brian Wall, over and out.